you to Professor Valiev for the introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here in uh, Moscow and Missis. And now I see all the experts in my subject are turning up for the talk. We have Professor Valiev and Professor Luzgin, so I better watch what I am saying because they know some of the subject better than I do. My subject is, in general, um, the glass, the glassy state. And I want to talk about how broad the property and structure range could be for a glass of a given uh, composition. I will focus on metallic glasses, but we will see that the story is not only for metallic glasses. Uh, here are some people who have been working with us in a recent uh, paper which we have submitted, and some people that we have thanked for discussions, and the work involves uh, groups in uh, Japan, where Professor Luzgin is also involved, um, in China, in Beijing, and uh, in Cambridge. And I'll start with the very basic slide which I have shown in earlier talks at MISIS on the question of how do you make a glass? Well, there is one way to do it in principle, which is you start in the liquid above the melting temperature. Your liquid is equilibrium, stable. You then cool. Well, of course, one possibility is that the liquid freezes to the crystal at this thermodynamically determined temperature. But perhaps the crystal does not succeed in nucleating, in which case you continue to cool the liquid. Its volume decreases. And as the liquid is cooled, it becomes more and more uh, viscous. It uh, does not flow so easily, is not so fluid. And you eventually form a solid, which in some sense preserves the structure of the liquid, but now has a fixed structure. Uh, the liquid, you could say, is defined by the fact that its structure is temperature dependent. And that's why the slope of this liquid line is greater than the slope of the crystal line. Both the crystal and the liquid show thermal expansion. And we understand why a crystal shows thermal expansion. It's to do with the anharmonicity of the atomic bonding. And that same argument applies for the liquid, but there's clearly something extra going on in the liquid. And that is that the liquid structure is dependent on temperature. That is not true for the glass. But on the other hand, there is not a single glass. If we cool the liquid very slowly, we will keep going further before we form the glass. If we cool it rapidly, we don't get so far. So we know already that there is a range in the glassy state, not a single glass. And one way to explore that range is to cool at different rates, fast or slow. And the theme of this talk is really going to be how wide can we make this range? And what are the mechanisms we can use to make it wider? One mechanism would be fast or slow cooling, but it is not the only mechanism. So let us look at the properties here. This could be volume against temperature, but I'm taking it to be the thermodynamic quantity of enthalpy, the heat content. And we imagine that we start in the liquid, we cool it, at some rate, and then we heat the glass back to the liquid at the same rate. We more or less follow the same path. There's a little bit of hysteresis in the middle where it gets complicated, but pretty much we come down and back up the same line. But what would happen if our rate of cooling was different from our rate of heating? Well, then you wouldn't follow the same line. Let us imagine that you heat more slowly at a lower rate. Then this glass is a relatively high energy, and it has time to relax to a state of lower energy before joining the liquid line. You would achieve the same shape of curve if you started with a glass that was initially less relaxed. And you would then see that you ha had a capability for reducing the energy of the glass, of making it more relaxed. So that's one possibility. 
Now let us explore the opposite possibility, which is that you, you cool at some rate, but now you heat faster at a higher rate. What would happen? Well, then your glass will be heated and it should start to form the liquid here, but in fact it keeps going because you're going so fast, the system doesn't react in time. So it overshoots, it goes beyond the correct point and then catches up with the liquid. And you would see a similar effect if you started with a glass that's initially more relaxed and then it has to get into the liquid state at a higher temperature with the red arrow. So here are the two shapes put together. You can get one or the other, and it tells you about the state of the glass. Uh, in one case, you can see that an unrelaxed glass, a high energy glass, shows relaxation. In the other case, a relaxed glass, a low energy glass, shows this overshoot peak. And these are peaks in the curves of the specific heat, which is just the derivative with temperature of the enthalpy. So it's just the gradient of these lines. So this is what you would measure in a calorimeter. So you can see here that to detect the state of the glass could in principle be rather easy by looking at this type of experimental data from a calorimeter. Well, here is how it looks for a glass made of a polymer, polymethyl methacrylate, PMMA. Uh, it has various trade names, um, but it's a very high quality cast polymer. And in its initial state, it is rather relaxed. So when you heat it up, you follow this line and you see that overshoot peak, that sharp spike. If you now take that sample of PMMA and you um, deform it, plastically deform it, so we do mechanical work on the system. We then push the polymer towards a higher energy state so that when we heat it up, we see this heat of relaxation. This is quite a big heat. In fact, interestingly, when you do the mechanical work on the polymer, you, of course, have an energy associated with that. And you can ask the question, how much of that energy remains stored inside the material? And the answer is a lot. Perhaps 30 to 60% of the energy is stored in the material. Ah. Okay, I can also just use this as a pointer, of course. Yeah, that's fine. Good, thank you. So this, is a, this area is a stored energy and it relates to the amount of mechanical work done. Now, the uh, metals people in the audience will realize that this is an unusually large number. Uh, because if you looked at a polycrystalline metal, uh, you, when you deform it, you do work, there is an energy, you change the structure of the material, in particular you will have more dislocations, more vacancies potentially, uh, you of course change the properties, but you can again ask, when we do mechanical work, how much of that energy is stored in the material? And the answer is not much. It's um, typically of the order of 1% only, perhaps a few percent. So this is very different from that polymeric case of PMMA. So we can then ask the question, what about metallic glasses when we deform them? Well, this is the point of interest. When we deal with um, polycrystalline metals, you know that plastic deformation, cold work, hot work, is an essential part of metal processing. You use it to improve the properties of the metal and get it into the shape you want. For glasses, we don't normally think that way. We don't think of glasses as being something that you could cold work but metallic glasses do allow us to cold work the glassy state. They are sufficiently plastic. So we can ask the question about metallic glasses. How would they be the same or different from what we see here? And in particular, what would we see for changes in mechanical and other properties? 
When we deform the metallic glass, what fraction of the energy would we store in the material? And we might think you could store nothing, because if you think about the crystal, when you deform it, you make defects, you make dislocations, and the dislocations have an energy. But you might think that the glass is already one big defect. It's just full of defects. How could you make it more disordered than it is already? So on that line of thought, you, it would be impossible to store energy in the glass. And of course, could we improve the properties? Now, for metallic glasses, uh, we need to think about what we want to do. The metallic glasses are very strong. They have a very large elastic strain. They can be very tough, but they are not at all ductile. If you take a rod of metallic glass and you look for tensile elongation, you will find it is zero. Not because the material is intrinsically brittle, in fact it is not. It shows local plastic deformation, but it shows a plastic instability. So we want to improve the ductility or plasticity of the metallic glass. Here's the conventional glass case, it's very brittle. So you don't imagine that you can undertake cold work of this material. But the metallic glass you can take as a rod and compress it, large strains, and so you can see it makes sense to think about mechanical processing of this material. So we can then ask the question, uh, could this deformation processing be used, as you would for conventional alloys, could it be used to make new structures and new properties? Well, what would happen if you try deforming a metallic glass? Um, there are two modes of deformation. One you are extremely familiar with. If you take an ordinary glass rod in the chemistry laboratory, you put it in a hot flame. It gets hot and soft and you can pull the rod out into a thin fiber. That is a viscous flow of the liquid, really. And that is this so-called homogeneous flow. So a material will deform uniformly and get longer and thinner, smaller diameter. That is uniform flow, but it is at high temperature. We are more interested in what happens at low temperature. And then we find that you get a local um, shearing of the material. So it does still show flow, but the flow is concentrated in a narrow shear band. You can think of both of these processes as going from the glass into a liquid state. So in one case, where we were heating the material up, it in fact enters the liquid state. And that you could think of as increasing the temperature of the system. And as you do, the viscosity decreases. This is a logarithmic scale of the viscosity coming down, so it's becoming more liquid. So you go from the glass to the liquid by raising the temperature. In the other case, when we were here, you can think of something happening locally which does not necessarily involve temperature. It can in fact be a pure effect of stress that when the structure is put under stress, it starts to flow and its viscosity in effect decreases locally in the material. And that is an instability, because just think, if you were doing this with a polycrystalline metal and you were making it flow, it would of course become harder. It would show work hardening, but this is showing softening, and that is why it is unstable. Now, the traditional area of forming glasses is very ancient, and you can form bottles and so on, blowing glasses. Um, you can do the same sort of thing with metallic glasses. This is an example where the softening temperature is below the boiling point of water. Um, and this flow is homogeneous and it's easy. It is possible, it is very possible, that this flow of the material makes some structural change in the material. 
But that structural change is very difficult to find because this is warm, so you may make a change, but the system anneals and relaxes back to the original structure. So you do not keep the deformed structure, you relax it. Here's the shear banding in operation. We can be fairly sure that the material inside these bands has a very different structure from the original structure. But the problem is the bands are extremely thin, a few tens of nanometers only. So the volume of material, which is changed by the deformation, is very small volume. So again, very difficult to measure what the structural change might be. Uh, the phenomenon is quite dramatic. Here are these shear bands on a belt bent wire. Uh, you might think they are something like cracks, but you can see that up close, this is definitely not a crack. It's just a shear plane, uh, no gap in the glass. If you take a deformed glass with those shear bands and you polish the surface, so you make a mirror finish, and then you put in acid and etch the surface, you find you can just about see where these bands were, which is telling us that in fact there is something different about the structure in that material as a locally different chemical behavior. Uh, but the problem, as I said earlier, the volume is very small. So the average structure of this material is really not changed only changed in a very small volume. However, maybe it's not quite so bad. There has been some work looking in a cross section with a shear band and looking at the hardness in the material and detecting that in principle one might get quite a broad zone on either side of a central shear band in which the material appears to be in some way affected. And this remains an active area of study uh, and I know that Professor Luzgin, for example, is looking at just this question of what are the properties around an active shear band and how do you, you explain it? Well, the effects of cold work on metallic glasses were first studied really rather a long time ago. Uh, it was studied in quite interesting areas like drawing metallic glass wires. They can be drawn quite a lot. They do see shear bands and those shear bands act to nucleate further flow. But you can imagine that if you have a band running across our material, that can also act as a barrier to the motion of other shear bands. So the propagation of shear bands can be blocked or stopped by other shear bands. So it is possible that you can change the deformation pattern by deforming the material itself. And how do you deform? Well, one way you could do it is by rolling, rolling a sheet. Uh, you then have a certain directionality and you can look for changes in properties as a result of that type of process, whether by rolling or uh, deformation. So here again, looking at rolling, um, it makes the material more plastic. It can flow better after the rolling. It, if you map properties such as hardness, it shows quite evident changes before and after rolling. The direction of change does not always seem to be the same, but you get a more inhomogeneous pattern of uh, the hardness in the material after the deformation. And you can look at the direction of the shear bands that form and relate this to getting some type of tensile ductility by stopping existing shear bands. Now, back to our question, a rather simple question, of stored energy. So our question is, we have our sample of glass, we deform it. In deforming it, we do mechanical work, so we put in energy, and we ask the question, how much of that energy is stored in the material? And we have seen two examples so far, a polycrystalline metal, typically stores 1%, maybe as many as 10% of the work in the material. The PMMA, the polymer, stored up to 60% in the material. 
what is the story with metallic glasses? Well, that was looked at rather early uh, by Hosu Chen. Here are the areas under these curves will be the energy. Um, and it's on a cold rolled material. And it's about 4% of the work done is stored. So roughly speaking, it's similar to the crystalline metal, um, but maybe a little bit higher. And the stored energy seems to increase linearly with the amount of uh, strain put into the material. Uh, one can characterize the energy in terms of an amount joules per mole of material, which is a good way to compare different materials. There are other ways you could store energy in the material. This is so-called shot peening, where you fire balls at the surface and they bounce off. So you get a very heavily mechanically deformed surface layer, uh, which may become softer and more energetic. And the uh, energy stored there is again a few percent of the cold work that is stored. This piece of work did have a surprise for us, however. This area here is the energy associated with the cold work. But the energy associated with the original material before cold work was this. In other words, more. So this was a strange case where you have a glass, you deform it, and after deformation its energy is lower, not higher. The deformation has actually reduced the energy of the material. And it's interesting to think about why that might be. And we could take an analogy here. This is not glassy materials and it is not deformation. It's a different situation, but it helps us think about the problem. Imagine you had a crystalline metal and you subject it to irradiation. You do damage in the material. So if you look at the dislocation density, you expect you start with a low dislocation density, and as you irradiate with neutrons, the dislocation density increases and saturates. So you damage the material. But when you irradiate a material, you also put more mobility into the material. The atoms can move more easily. So let us imagine that you did not start with a well annealed metal, but instead you started with a cold worked metal. You would start with a much higher dislocation density. And then you would find that under irradiation, you always end up in the same final steady state, but now your dislocation density would decrease to reach that state. So the point is when you have something like irradiation, the dislocation density can increase or decrease depending on your starting condition. And it is similar for our metallic glass that this metallic glass was a starting condition of being very unrelaxed, very energetic. Uh, and uh, we actually reduce the energy by the deformation. There are other ways you can energize a metallic glass. I have focused on cold work. There's been a lot of interest in the literature, uh, high profile papers, looking at the mechanical properties of very small samples of materials in general, but also metallic glasses. And this is really very small, of order 100 nanometers diameter and so on. Question is, how do you make this so small? Well, one way is by using ions to machine the shape. So you can make the, in effect, uh, nano wires by uh, irradiation with gallium ions, which then makes this shape, blow away the outside. And people were interested in the property of the material. And they found that the property becomes different when this is very small. That's the fundamental interest. But what they probably missed was that when you make this with a process using gallium ions, you of course damage the material. So it may be smaller, 
but it is not the original material. It is now a transformed material. And this has now been studied, and people have looked at how the properties vary. Under a radiation, you get a more uh, plastic behavior. Uh, you can go to higher strains. And the really important point is, if you take this material which has been irradiated, so its energy has gone up, and you then anneal it, you can bring the energy back down and you go back to something more like the original properties. So this is another way of damaging uh, the material. This is further uh, cold work uh, by shot peening so with different starting conditions and simply to make the point that if you want to damage the material, you always have a competition. You put damage in but the material will naturally relax to reduce the damage. If you do the same process at a lower temperature, the damage in is the same, but the relaxation is less, so the overall effect is more damage. So we can now look at how much the energy changes. This is effectively uh, zero stored energy here, and then this is coming down, so larger and larger negative enthalpies. And this simply shows that if you do the treatment at room temperature, the energy changes a little bit. If you do exactly the same treatment at liquid nitrogen temperature, the energy changes a lot. And if you have a different starting condition, you may get different amounts. But it is still true that the room temperature change is smaller than the liquid nitrogen change. So we have some idea what we want to do if we want to get more energetic states we should make the change at a lower temperature. Or we could make the deformation harder. And in one way we can do this with this shot peening is to use heavy steel shot balls rather than uh, silica beads. You can then store more energy. This is again joules per mole. And you can then start to see changes in the diffraction pattern of the material. This is a subtraction of two patterns. Each pattern shows a principal peak, this radial variation of intensity. It's a peak in intensity here, but that peak shifts. So when you subtract one pattern from the other, you see this uh, ripple in the pattern. It corresponds to a volume increase, a density decrease in material. In this case, it's the process of high pressure torsion, and that's something that Professor Valiev will be able to tell us about uh, later on. So this is a way of getting a lot of energy into the material. And here's the stored energy, goes up to about two kilojoules per mole. That's the highest number I have so far given you in this talk. And this particular figure we will return to uh, later in the talk, but I think this is something like a world record figure for how much energy is stored in any uh, material by mechanical work. And this is after some 50 rotations in a high pressure torsion rig. So let's now look at these numbers. If you have a crystalline metal, you can store a little bit of energy in the material in the form of dislocations. And I told you already that you might store 1% of the mechanical work perhaps as much as 10%. But let's now compare this to a sort of fundamental number that would characterize the energy of a material, namely the latent heat of melting, how much energy you would need to melt a material. So a typical really high stored energy in a crystalline metal is 1% or one tenth of 1% of the heat of melting. You compare this with metallic glasses in the Azka state, Professor Inouye, a real expert in the field of metallic glasses, quoted a range of numbers in an Azka metallic glass of this magnitude of joules per mole. And you can change this a little bit, but that would be of the order of 5 to 14% of the heating melting. And now let's imagine we do some cold work. Here was our early work, here's some later work, and here is that high pressure torsion work you're now storing up to almost a quarter of the heat of melting as a stored energy. This is enormously different from the crystalline metal. 
So it's saying that the range of structural states, at least in terms of their energy, is enormously wide, two to three orders of magnitude wider in the glass than it is in the crystal. Um, and that must mean you have a, access to a range of properties, and we can ask the question, will some of those be interesting? Of course, if you devote some thought to this, what I have compared here is a pure metal, so there's no, nothing going on here of chemical interest. Of course, there's a lot of chemistry in a metallic glass. You are mixing different elements with different heats of mixing. So one can imagine large chemical contributions to this. Nonetheless, it's a very wide range of energy compared to the crystalline state. So far, I have concentrated on cold work of the metallic glass. So you plastically deform it, it has a different shape after the process. Let's now think, and maybe it is not surprising that that changes the energy of the material. Let's now think about something different. Let us imagine we stay firmly within the elastic range. So we don't go close to plasticity. So here's work from Korea, a metallic glass, compressed at 95% of the yield stress. So it's in the elastic range, and you leave it for a long time at room temperature. You see a little bit of room temperature creep. Uh, the experiment is extremely simple. Uh, you have a, a cylinder of the material, and you load it elastically in compression. And you come back after 30 hours, and you measure the volume of the cylinder, and you find the volume is larger. So you've been holding it under compression. You might expect the volume would be smaller, but no, it's bigger. In truth, um, the uh, experiment they did, they concluded that there had to be a decrease in density, but it was an indirect measurement, and we later did some related experiments, in this case at 80% of the yield stress, and looked at the decrease in density with a direct measure. So the volume, density goes down, the volume goes up as a result of this compression. And it's because under compression, it's of course not hydrostatic compression, it's in one direction only, you get some creep effectively, that means some shear of the material, and the shearing gives you an increase in volume. So that, in turns out, that increase in volume changes the properties of the material and, in fact, makes it more plastic in the elastic range, which is interesting. Here's another story of what might happen in the elastic range. So this is an experiment in indentation, nano-indentation, so you have your material and you indent it. Well, the normal way you do the experiment is you apply a load and you measure the displacement of the tip as a function of the load. And at some point, of course, you will get a plastic deformation and an indent. And you know when that will happen. So imagine you start with a rather low load in the elastic range and you now cycle the load. You just increase and decrease elastically. And then you indent. What these people found is that the uh, load at which you first get a plastic indent shows a broad variation. But this seems to be not experimental error. It seems to be an actual variation, if you like, in the hardness of the material from place to place. So you have a sample of glass, and it seems that some places really are softer, and some places are harder. And you get a spread in this yield load, where the first yield occurs in the sample. This is if you just do the indentation immediately. But if you instead do this cycling and then indent, you find that the yield load moves to the right. The material gets harder. In the previous case, in the elastic range, the material would have become softer, 
this is harder. So it seems sitting in a purely elastic range, you can move the properties in either direction. Or here's another example where you're not doing cold work. You're simply doing an ultrasonic treatment of the glass and it gets harder. This again is a hardness map. Maybe it's a little bit more inhomogeneous and the general hardness increases. So our picture so far is if you take a glass, it has a range of possible states. You can change those states by an annealing treatment, a heat treatment. That would then cause the glass to relax. Its volume will decrease. You get some changes in elastic properties and the glass generally becomes more brittle, which of course is what we do not want to achieve. So the reason, if you like, for this entire area of research is that annealing a glass and changing its properties is rather easy to do, but it moves the properties in the wrong direction. So we want some magic way of doing the opposite of annealing. We want some mechanism for unannealing, and that's not so easy, of course. Uh, the cold work is one way possibly of doing it, and it achieves the opposite of relaxation. You could think of relaxation like aging, and the opposite is rejuvenation, making something young again. Um, or it can, in fact, make it relax as well. It can go either way. And the elastic loading seems to give you possibly either direction as well, rejuvenation or relaxation. Now I get to the area which was of interest to Professor Valiev, yeah, of nano glasses. The glasses I've talked about so far, we start with a liquid and we make a glass. So we have our glassy material. Could be possibly quite a large volume of glass. Imagine if you had a very fine powder, possibly a nano powder, where each particle is a metallic glass particle, and you compacted that, then it would look a little bit like the grain structure in a crystalline metal, but the grains would be a particle of a glass, not crystalline, but they would have some sort of lower density boundary with the next grain of glass. That is one way of making a nanoglass, and we may hear about others from Professor Valiev in the form of plastically deforming material, and in some way what I have talked about already by cold work, putting shear bands in, you're dividing the glass into different regions and maybe making a nano glass. The nano glass is a bit like a nano crystalline material, but where the grain is glassy, not crystalline. Now, a theme for this talk is, do you have to make a nano glass by these methods? Or what is an ordinary metallic glass like? To put that question another way, I could ask, is every glass already a nano glass? And my suggestion is that maybe every glass is already a nano glass. It just matters how much. And here is uh, an example of work from uh, Japan where they uh, crystallized a metallic glass and they get crystalline regions and non-crystalline regions. Now, if they do this heat treatment to get the crystallization and just with a heat treatment, the crystallization is quite uniform. But if they do it with an ultrasonic vibration as well, two things happen. The crystallization is faster and it becomes non-uniform. So you have this pattern which develops which only shows up under the ultrasonic treatment. And it is completely unrelated to the ultrasonic wavelength, which of course is much, much, much bigger than this. So it's something else. And the interpretation of these authors was that the original metallic glass has got, if you like, softer and harder regions, and that the ultrasonic treatment stimulates crystallization in the softer regions. So that this, in a way, is a map of hard and soft regions in the original glass. Well, that was just an idea, and it's rather hard to verify that idea. But one can set about mapping the properties of a metallic glass. 
I already showed you curves from nano indentation of yield load. And what I showed was you had a distribution curve. Here, if you like, is a map of this sort of distribution, a mapping of the heterogeneity in a metallic glass, sort of Gaussian spread in the property. In this case, it's an energy dissipation. Here's another type of mapping, limited resolution, but in this case, it's a spread of elastic modulus. And, and in effect, it's about a, the, the, you get the modulus from resonance frequencies, and it's about a 30% spread in uh, the modulus. And it's much wider. Uh, this, you, these distributions appear to be the same width, but look at the scale. This is for the glass, this is 246%, this is 0 0.04, 0 0.08, so they're quite different scales. And the glass has a much wider range of the property. So it suggests the glass might really be different from place to place. Is this nano indentation? Uh, yes, it, it's a special type of nano indentation. So you use a probe technique, but then you have to vibrate the tip and you look for a resonance frequency. So it's not a simple hardness. It, um, so they're quite difficult measurements, I would say. Now, Let's further develop this idea of the glass being non-uniform. Uh, you could imagine a crystal with a nice, well-defined crystal lattice, and I maybe do something simple to it. I compress it. And you could imagine that the compressive strain is exactly the same everywhere. That would be the simple picture. That would be a uniform strain. You could call that technically an affine strain. So you make some macroscopic strain, and the local strain is the same everywhere, 1%, for example. But now imagine that my material was not uniform. I could apply the same strain, but inside, locally, the strain could be different from place to place. The average would be the same, but it would be different in different places. That would be a non-affine strain. Well, it seems clear that in the metallic glass, you have clusters of atoms, central atom, atoms around, and that cluster is rather stiff. It's effectively the same stiffness, same elastic modulus as the crystal. But the glass as a whole has a lower modulus than the crystal. And one can, in computer simulations, kick out the relative displacements for different positions, looking at all atoms, or looking at um, these are uh, copper central atoms in a cluster. And the cluster in this case is a full icosahedron. We should not worry too much about the detail of the structure. My point is only that. Of course, when you load the material elastically, it shows a shape change, it has a strain, but the distribution of that strain is different for different types of position in the structure. So it's interesting that this uh, has a compressive strain of 2%. Of course, if we use the conventional sign, we would say minus two is the strain. Locally, the strain in this material varies from uh, minus six to plus two. So in other words, 4% on either side of this value. So if I, it means if I take the glass and I change its dimension by 2%, the average strain is 2%. But internally, locally, the strain varies by 4% on either side of the average. Uh, and even changes sign. So it goes all the way from minus 6 to plus 2. So our question then is, if every glass is a nanoglass, so it's intrinsically heterogeneous, can we somehow use that fact? So could we use these non-affine strains, the fact that the strain is not uniform? Well, let me take you to a totally different world, nothing to do with glasses.
and into the world of a nuclear reactor. So here are some fuel assemblies for a nuclear reactor. Now, in a nuclear reactor, about the best fuel you could get is uranium metal. And uranium metal is very ductile and easy to form into plate and cylinders. But uranium metal is not much used in reactors. These are rods of uranium dioxide. And the reason uranium is not used is because it has many problems. And here is one problem. Uranium, alpha uranium, is in fact orthorhombic. So it's a low symmetry structure. And its uh, thermal expansion is, to say the least, interesting. Uh, you, of course, in an orthorhombic structure have the A, B, and C lattice parameters. Um, when you heat it up, the volume does increase. Um, that's because the A and the C lattice parameters increase, but the B lattice parameter can actually have a significant temperature range in which it decreases. So now imagine that you make a polycrystal of uranium. You have a grain in one place, one orientation, sitting next to a grain of different orientation. You can easily see that the expansion coefficients will simply not match. And so you do damage inside the material. In the particular case here, that damage is uh, not a good thing to have because the uh, uranium rod, for example, is a polycrystal. But of course, the orientation of the grains in the polycrystal is not random. It is textured. It's a preferred orientation. And so you get a net change, which turns out to be a shape change. So amazingly, if you took a nice um, cylinder of uranium metal and you now subject it to a range of temperature, just a little oscillation in temperature, that cylinder will become larger in diameter and shorter. Its, its volume will stay the same, but it shows this phenomenon of so-called growth, thermal cycling growth. So you change the temperature and it changes shape. Well, that's a bad thing. But it arises because internally, the thermal strains are different from place to place. They are non-affine. So what would happen in a glass? Well, your uh, standard view would be that the glass, you will remember, comes from the liquid. The liquid has nothing like grains or grain boundaries or different phases. The liquid is perfectly uniform. And so you would assume the glass is perfectly uniform and therefore it could not show something like that uranium sample. You could not have some effect of the thermal cycling. But let us look to see what actually happens. So we took a series of metallic glasses, different compositions. We needn't worry about what they are exactly. Different sample types and dimensions. And we look at a temperature range. So this is from absolute zero up to the glass transition temperature of the material. We know that you get relaxation of a glass, but that happens close to the glass transition temperature, down to about 60% of the glass transition temperature, you see thermal relaxation. All of our experiments will be in the temperature range below that. So we do not expect any thermal relaxation. It's a cold mechanical process. And we vary the temperature between room temperature on this normalized scale that shows up as a range uh, down to liquid nitrogen temperature. So we just cycle. And we look to see what happens. Well, if the glass is completely uniform, you will expect that nothing happens. But in fact, what we'll be looking for is can we see a change in energy? This is a reminder back to our polymer PMMA, that if you mechanically deformed it, you got this process of rejuvenation, which gives you an extra energy in the calorimetry trace, which was not there before. Well, here's the example of our metallic glass. Uh, it goes through a glass transition and crystallizes. This is the region of the energy release. Here it is. And this is how it changes 
as a result of the temperature cycling. This might look like a rather small change in some way, but the, it's a 50% increase in the stored energy in the material. If we simply hold the sample at liquid nitrogen temperature, so hold it for four hours, that is effectively one cycle. We've gone from room temperature to liquid nitrogen and back up. You might expect that will have some effect, but the effect is small. So we believe that the effect that we see is not a, a treatment at liquid nitrogen temperature, which you could think of as annealing at liquid nitrogen temperature. It's not that. It is instead the cycling. It's the fact that we change the temperature. And as you change with more cycles, the increase in the heat becomes even bigger. And then interestingly, it goes into reverse for even higher cycle numbers. And we see this for different sample geometries. There's one element of detail I should mention. I talked earlier about the uh, elastic work in indentation, that if you uh, cycle in the elastic range and then indent, the material becomes harder. So it says that doing something in the elastic range, just with stresses, no temperature, can change the properties. When we do our liquid nitrogen treatment, you could think, well, of course, that does not just change the temperature, you may also have stresses. You put the thing into a cold liquid, you pull it out, maybe there will be stresses inside the material. And it must be true that there are some stresses, because when you put the room temperature sample in liquid nitrogen, we can be sure that the surface becomes cold before the middle. So you have a temperature gradient in the sample, which will generate stress. But when you look at the magnitude of those stresses, you can calculate this in terms of this dimensionless number, the so-called BO number. Uh, avoiding the detail, let us just say that if this number is lower than this sort of value, you more or less can ignore the temperature gradients in the sample. And when you do the calculations here, they are indeed very low numbers. So I think we have no stress effect. The reason for that is rather easy to understand. In the end, our samples are metallic. They are metallic glass. So the thermal conductivity in the glass is quite high. And so you tend to have a rather uniform temperature inside the glass. So we think that the stresses are not an important effect. The effect is because of the temperature change. The magnitude I already mentioned is about 50% increase in the energy stored. This is remarkable because taking you back to this earlier work, when we looked at a glass, it had this stored energy, we then mechanically deformed it. We found that the energy actually went down on mechanical deformation. But this treatment, the energy goes higher. So even if this is a high energy, we can make that energy even higher by the thermal cycling treatment. So it's, it's a more powerful treatment than the mechanical deformation. And I showed you this plot. So I'll draw Professor Valiev's attention to this number here. This is our world record energy storage with high pressure torsion, heavy plastic deformation in the glass. This is the amount of energy stored as a result of 10 thermal cycles in liquid nitrogen. So it's like one turn of the high pressure torsion. That seems remarkable. The high pressure torsion is a very major deformation of the material, and it's putting in the same energy as the temperature cycling to liquid nitrogen. Um, of course, there are many things that we could improve. We have done very simple experiments. We have not really played with what are the optimum temperatures or what are the optimum heating and cooling rates, or what are the optimum holding times. These we have not explored. We have done a little bit of work on this low temperature. Should we use liquid nitrogen? Or maybe that's too much. We could use solid CO2, or maybe we could use liquid helium. 
our initial measurements of the stored energy, um, uh, the change in the heat of relaxation uh, show that it may be uh, optimum around the liquid nitrogen point. And of course, liquid nitrogen is extremely easy to use. So that is why we based our experiments on liquid nitrogen. Um, of course, we're not really interested in the stored energy, you might say. We want a proper property change. What could we look for? Well, it seems like the glass transition behavior is slightly altered as a result of the cycles, but this is maybe quite a small change. Um, the structure appears not to be altered. Of course, in some way, we know the structure is changed. The point is, however, the changes are rather small and not easily detected with this type of X-ray technique. Now, I mentioned about the nano-indentation work. This is a good example where you take as-cast glass, you load it, here's the load, this is the depth of your displacement. This is elastic, and at some quite sharp, well-defined point, you get this step. So this so-called uh, pop-in is a roughly constant load but increased displacement. It's the point where the indenter goes into the sample. And the first point is clearly identifiable, and it may vary for a sample. It's different in different places. And this shows the spread of that value of the initial yield pressure for the ASCAS glass. If we take it down to uh, liquid nitrogen for 10 minutes and bring it back, this distribution shifts a little bit um, by about 3%. If we do a further 10 cycles to liquid nitrogen, it shifts a further 17%. So in effect, in terms of this measurement, you have something like a 20% reduction in the hardness of the material as a result of this temperature cycling. Um, and the width of the distribution increases, which suggests greater heterogeneity in the sample. So the as-cast glass shows rather large yield pressures, rather large values of those displacements, and after all this cycling, you get much lower yield pressures and some extremely low values and low values of the displacement as well. So the sample is becoming more plastic. It's easier to deform, and the plasticity is less catastrophic. Looking at the actual hardness, that is where you do your indent and then really keep indenting. So it's the stress for continuous flow. Uh, you get similar behavior, but the magnitude is smaller, which basically says that the conditions for continuing flow are less sensitive to local differences, heterogeneities, than uh, you would have for the initial yield behavior. So you, you load, you have initial yield behavior, which shows a broad range of values, and you continue to deform, and you get a narrower range of values. Young's modulus of the sample is measurable by indentation techniques and shows uh, decreases as well. We need not worry about the exact magnitudes, but you can see the same sort of pattern showing up that one cycle gives you a little bit of change, a further 10 cycles gives you a lot of change. The overall modulus of the sample, the macroscopic modulus, we can measure uh, by a resonance technique, and that does not show a measurable change. So it suggests that whatever the change is in the sample, it is something localized, which is picked up with a local indentation probe, but not with the macroscopic measurement. Um, this is an interesting comparison, too, where um, I mentioned to you that the initial yield load, as a result of cycling the temperature, reduces by 20%. If you do a shot peening treatment of the surface of a glass, so very heavy mechanical deformation, you, you have an identical effect, a reduction by about 20%. So again, it's interesting that this very heavy plastic deformation changes the properties by the same amount as this temperature cycling. And the hardness also varies in shot peening 
but uh, let's not worry about that here. So our picture is that the initial glass is, if you like, already not uniform. It already has some soft spots. The soft spot, of course, has a lower elastic modulus. That would also automatically mean a higher thermal expansion coefficient. So the thermal expansion coefficient in the glass would vary from place to place. So when you then cycle the temperature, you produce more damage in the glass. And you make more and more soft spots. So that's the concept of the work. Does it do anything useful for you? Well, I mentioned to you that metallic glasses have got many good properties, but they have one very bad property, which is that they are not uh, sufficiently plastic. You would like greater plasticity. Well, this shows for an as-cast glass, you get a certain amount of plastic flow, but if you go through some cycles, you get more and more and more and more plastic flow. So you can increase the plastic strain by some amount. You can look at how that varies for different samples, different magnitudes of plastic strain, but it always goes up. The overall hardness of the sample always comes down. So its flow is easier. It's about a 4% decrease in the micro hardness. So this is not nano, this is a conventional micro hardness measurement. And here's a different form of metallic glass. Now it's a cuboid shape. Again, the ASCAS sample shows greater plasticity after cycling. If we have a very highly annealed glass, it becomes brittle. And however much cycling we do, it seems to stay brittle. But if we have a partially annealed glass, which goes brittle, but you then cycle it, you can recover some plasticity. So it looks like we have achieved what I said would be like magic that we have in a way a sort of method of unannealing. You, you can heat treat the sample, you can get it relaxed, and then you can make it less relaxed again um, by this process. Um, so this was our earlier picture, and now we must add to this picture in terms of what we can do with this temperature cycling. What about um, toughness of a material? Well. Uh, the story with metallic glasses is somehow interesting. Uh, you can look at toughness and yield strength. And normally, um, they uh, do not go together, if I can put it this way. So here on this map, these are logarithmic scales, this would be a contour of a constant product of these two quantities. And the way it works out for steels is, of course, the one that you are so familiar with. You can take a... Uh, uh, a steel, you quench it into water, you get hard martensitic steel. So that's a good example of having a very high flow stress. Sigma y for the martensite is high, but of course the toughness is low. And then you could temper that steel and you go from having a high flow stress and low toughness to the opposite, where you could have a high toughness but a low flow stress. So you travel along this line. But you cannot have both a high flow stress and a high toughness. That's the point. But you might ask the question, what material could give us the best combination of these two, the best product? And that would be moving this red line as far as possible to the top right-hand corner. And interestingly, of all the engineering materials looked at, it's a metallic glass which shows the best combination of these two. So the, the world record holder for the product of sigma y and kc is a metallic glass. And it seems to achieve it by still having shear bands but having many shear bands, which gives a lot of energy absorption at a notch and does not help the crack to grow. It hinders crack growth by having all this energy absorption and shear bands. So our message is, if you want good properties, including high toughness, in a metallic glass, you want many shear bands. And it turns out that our, oops, our thermal cycling, you can't see this here, but an as-cast glass gives rather infrequent shear bands, and after cycling they become more frequent. This is the actual numbers for the spacing between typical shear bands. So it looks like the damage we do uh, does in fact induce um, 
uh, more shear banding, which should be a good thing. So I've come to my conclusions, which are first that the metallic glasses seem to be heterogeneous. You might have thought they would be very uniform, very homogeneous, coming from the liquid, but it seems they are rather heterogeneous. An automatic implication from that is that elastic strains in metallic glasses are non-affine. They are not the same from place to place. When you then strain the system, you will get local areas of mismatch between the elastic strains. You can get local atomic rearrangements. These dissipate energy, so they're dissipative events. Room temperature creep is a rather gentle process, but it already induces rejuvenation. The volume of the sample goes up, and elastic cycling can induce relaxation. The opposite, thermal cycling, it's a rather low strain amplitude. The actual amplitude is 0.3% as you go from room temperature to liquid nitrogen. So it's well within the elastic range. Um, of course, it wouldn't be plastic anyway because it's hydrostatic, but uh, just to give you a sense, the elastic range of a metallic glass elastic limit is typically 2%. So we are here at a strain of 0.3%. And in that range, we induce rejuvenation and you get some improvements in plasticity. I also mentioned on the way through that the energy range in glassy states is large compared to defective crystals and we could take as an area for future work how high could we make the energy of the glass? How high can we go? What would set the limit? It might be that the glass crystallizes or it just automatically relaxes back or you just develop holes in the glass. The extra volume could condense out as discrete voids. And then there's this whole business, which is unexpected perhaps, that you can have mechanical annealing. We are familiar with annealing by heat, but maybe you can do it purely mechanically and a whole range of phenomena to be explored where you're doing damage, but you also have extra mobility, so you accelerate relaxation. And these treatments may improve the properties of the material, and thermal cycling might be useful. My slide to end with is, if we have as our aim to rejuvenate a metallic glass, to raise its energy and raise its volume, in fact, this has already been known to be possible you can do it by ion irradiation, I mentioned, the elastostatic loading, room temperature creep, and plastic deformation. But doing it by thermal cycling is particularly attractive. It's simple to do. It's non-destructive. There's no shape change in your sample. Uh, it's isotropic. You could apply it to any sample. You can repeat it as much as you want. Um, it affects the whole sample, not just the surface and not just inside shear bands. It's of course very easy to control. Uh, you can do it for some component you've already made. It doesn't induce any residual stresses and you're certainly not going to get any plastic flow because you're very well inside the elastic limit. So my um, controversial uh, message, it's especially controversial for Professor Valiev, is that nano glasses are very interesting but maybe every glass is already a nano glass. And you can exploit that heterogeneity with treatments such as this. Thank you very much, and I will be happy to deal with um, questions. Excellent lecture as usual. And uh, one, one question is, uh, what do you think about uh, this um, uh, equivalence of stress and temperature in Egami's chair uh, Egami model? So um, um, I can say, for example, the uh, R delta T is much, much bigger than uh, what you introduce by, uh, by stresses when you lower the sample. So they're not, not equal in, in numbers, very different. Uh, 
So is it because, for example, of stress localization, then we have much higher uh, stress, stresses locally or or then opposite uh, some part of our delta T energy, thermal energy, is lost for um, some kind of entropy losses or so on. Um, I try to calculate and make it, um, make it in numbers, but it doesn't, uh, they don't correspond to each other. I mean, that one, um, it and Chen model. Yes. I think what is way missing from the picture which I showed is exactly that question of the role of localization. And that changes everything, of course, uh, by orders of magnitude in terms of local energy density and everything and local strains. So if I was looking for something as a potential way of explaining the problem, that's where I would look, would be to do with the localization. Can we do it? I don't know. <laughs> because none of these, much as the localization has been much studied, um, amazingly, there is no model that will predict the thickness of the shear band. They can predict one, the fluid state and the solid state, but they, the, there is no existing model to tell us how thick that band should be. Amazingly. Okay, thank you very much. More questions? Of course, there are no stupid questions and only stupid answers. Um, and the, uh, the rate is just determined by um, plunging into the liquid nitrogen. So we haven't, in fact, measured that. Uh, these rates are quite well understood, by the way, um, because uh, liquid nitrogen cooling treatments are very widely used in the biomedical area. So actually, there are lots of, of measurements on. Uh, as I said, we. Uh, can understand the point of your question that there could indeed be a most efficient or most optimum rate but in fact we have not explored that yet. Uh, our, our work so far has just been to say well this is an effect which the world did not expect. This, this, the, 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 according to the world this should not exist so we just show the effect but we have not optimized the effect at all at this stage. Our suspicion is that it would be optimized with the fastest possible rate, but we don't know. Thank you. And one more question regarding your exciting uh, suggestion. Any amorphous alloy might be like nanoglasses. Right? Yes. So, uh, in this case, possible to you know, to suggest uh, some chemical redistribution of in, uh, of atoms in, uh, in at interfaces and inside grains. Well, uh, it might be observed, for example, through the atom tomography. Uh, we have not considered uh, chemical effects uh, at all. But in um, principle, it's possible. Not only that. I think it's a great opportunity because if we are correct, uh, we need the original glass to be non-uniform to see our effect. Mm -hmm. And if you really anneal the glass, you destroy the effect because the, the very well annealed glass is more uniform. So if you start with a nano glass, a real nano glass, it's of course very non-uniform. So you should see an enormous effect of the cycling, maybe. Um, so there's a whole other thing to play with. Of course, we don't know that's true. It could be, I showed you examples where the deformation does not move the energy up even more. It can bring it down if you start with an unrelaxed state. So in truth, we don't really know what would happen if you started with a chemically inhomogeneous nanoglass. It could be a very big effect or maybe a negative effect, but I'm sure it would be a different effect. And the chemistry would be important for that. You see, this is very exciting, but mm -hmm. suggestions still should be posted. Okay, any more questions? If no, 
Professor Gray will be here today and tomorrow up to Saturday and you will have a special meeting with this. So what time do we start the next lecture? Uh, um, it will be in 30 minutes. 30 minutes. So I guess if people wish to ask me questions, but not publicly, no. <laughs> which sometimes people don't like to ask in front of the big crowd, then that, I will be happy. Yeah. Thank you very much for your thank you. And thank you, of course, for <laughs> the